Hello and welcome to today's product video. So today we're going to be looking at the Camium Networks CN Maestro platform. This is a cloud platform, it's absolutely free to use. It means you can do everything from monitor, configure, operate and manage your entire network from a single pane of glass. So this will cover EPMP, Camium Core, Camium CN Pilot, as well as Camium CN Matrix switching. So if you don't already have an account, if you head over to cloud.camionetworks.com and create one, it's absolutely free to do. If you do already have an account though, then you will be able to see the page that I'm seeing and create a new company account. So I'm just going to create our first account here. Then I'm going to select my country and region. Select my time zone. And then I'm going to choose my account view. So the account view basically determines what I see on the screen, so what icons I get presented with. So as we're running, you're looking at w, WLAN or wireless LAN. I'm going to select that. If you select access and backhaul or industrial internet, it's basically for the other range of products that you can view. So if you're looking to configure CN Matrix, for example, uh, you'd actually be looking at access and backhaul or industrial internet. Now, because EPMP doesn't automatically find its way to the cloud, you actually have to tell the devices where to go. We need to use something called an onboarding key. This is a way of ensuring that only the devices which are supposed to be on your Cambium CN Maestro platform are on your CN Maestro platform. So entering a random key, it has to be eight characters or more. Then I'm going to click agree to the terms and conditions and click create account. So once I do that, it's going to go away, it's going to build my company account, and I will get presented with a screen in front of you. So the first thing we need to do is we're going to click on onboard devices. It's then going to ask us for our serial number when we click on claim device. And then we click on claim device. So this is going to go away and check and make sure that the device isn't active in someone else's account. Luckily ours isn't. So it's then going to wait for device. So we don't click approve just yet. So before we do that, we're going to go away and create our AP groups, create our first WLAN. And then we can go and modify these settings, and we'll touch on that later in the video. So let's create our first WLAN. So I'm going to click on the wireless symbol, and then click on New WLAN. So first we need to give it a name. And then the moment you hit the Tab button, it's going to populate the SSID for you. Now, you can have different mesh modes if you wish to do so. Um, you can also change the VLAN ID. You can change the security to make sure it's a pre-shared key, make sure it's secure. Uh, by default, the pre-shared key is 12345678. You can also choose which radios are going to be on or off. So you may be in a built-up area, such as in a skyscraper or a tower block, and you may find that 2.4 gigahertz is too congested. Therefore, you may want to disable it and only actually use a 5 gigahertz band. So it's entirely up to you. You then do have advanced settings, which we'll touch on in another video, but just a quick overview, you can choose how many clients are allowed to connect to the device. You can choose the session and activity timeout. You can drop multicast traffic. You can disable band steering. You can disable proxy art. You've got a lot of different options at your disposal. Now, being an enterprise access point, you can actually use radio servers. Um, we're not going to do it today, but you can you know, load balance, choose an accounting server. You then got different ac guest access options. So you can use captive portals. You've got access control, so this is a very powerful feature where you can actually you know, block people getting uh, to certain areas of your network via layer 3. You can block certain MAC addresses. You can even choose what time of day people are allowed to access between certain times, and you can rate limit per client or per WLAN. We also have Passpoint and EPSK, which we're not going to talk about today, but we will do another video on. EPSK is a unique way of making sure that everyone has their own unique encryption key without any additional authentication sources such as Active Directory or LDAP. So going back to our WLAN, I'm going to click Save. Now that it's saved, I need to create an AP group. So when we create an AP group, we're basically going to be defining how our network operates. Now we're going to go ahead and create a new AP group over here. So what we do here, we're just going to give it a name, so Codicom AP Group. We're then going to choose the country, so we're in the United Kingdom. Now this is important because it's making sure that we are abiding by our country's 
uh, regulations, making sure we have the 2.45 gigahertz power on the actual radios at the right levels, um, make sure we're abiding by DFS, for example, in the UK. But you can then also choose a location, choose a contact name, choose a description. You can select whether the AP is an indoor or outdoor unit. You can also change the PoE output. So some devices have the ability to power other devices. So the E500, for example, series and the E700, they have PoE outputs. Now, that can be used to power a subscriber module, such as a 4180 or 450 series. Now, in doing so, they actually use a different voltage. So we can select Cambium PoE and make sure that we can power those units. Or if we're powering a CCTV camera, for example, we can select 802.3F and make sure that we will give enough power to the camera. We can also choose to disable the LED. Now, this is a very handy feature to have. So if you're using something like a E430W or E430H, when it's in a student accommodation in a room, for example, you may want to disable the LED. That will actually turn off the LED so you won't see the light at all. So now we're going to add our WLAN. So we're going to click on Podicom test and click add. Then we're going to go to management. So you don't have to click save every time. You can just go through all the steps. We're going to disable HTTP. I'm going to change the administration password. In doing so, this will make sure that the default password is no longer in use. So if someone does log into the access point directly, they won't know this password. We can then select different time zones and use uh, NTP for external time source authentication. But for the series of this video, we're not going to do that. You can then adjust your radio configuration. So this is quite an important setting. So you can disable the actual radio itself for this network policy or leave it enabled. You can change the transmit power or leave it on automatic mode, which I find just works perfectly adequate. But the one thing that we will change here is we're going to change our minimum unicast rate and we're going to set it to 12. And the reason why we do this is really simple. Devices such as, you know, iPhones, iPads, and Android devices, they can sometimes get locked to a certain AP. And the problem is that when that happens, they get really low data rates, I meaning they don't act as they should do, they get really slow performance. So by setting it to a minimum of 12, and it does depend on your environment, to be quite honest, um, but 12 has never really had an issue for me, means that the devices will automatically roam away to the nearest AP, which means that you get improved performance as a result, and you get around the sticky client issue. So on the 2.4, I'm going to set it to 12. I'm then going to enable airtime fairness. So airtime fairness is a way of making sure that everyone on your network has a fair share of the usage. So what it does is, if you've got an 802.11 device and an 802.11 AC device, with this disabled, the 802.11 AC device would actually have to slow down and talk at the same speed and send, work at the same data rate as the DOS 11N device. So what we're doing here with airtime fairness is we're actually giving each device its own time slice, meaning if you're an 802.11 device, you can send as much data as you can within your time slice, and the same for the AC device. So naturally, the 802.11 AC device with higher data rates will be able to send more data than an 11N device. So it's just a way of making sure the entire network is fair. So moving on to our 5 gigahertz band, we're going to change our channel width to either 20 or 40 megahertz, um, simply for this the reason that if you use 80 megahertz, you don't have that many channels available to you. Um, so if you're in a busy environment or a highly densely populated environment, you may find that you actually get a lot of co-channel interference or adjacent channel interference. So if you use 2040, you generally won't have any issues. And again, we're going to set a minimum unicast rate to be 12 and enable airtime fairness. Scrolling back to the top, we're then going to click on network. So in our network section, there's one setting which always catches people out. So typically, most people are going to have different SSIDs and can use different VLANs. Now, in doing that, you need to make sure that you've also got your switch configured. But the actual access point itself, by default, only has it set to accept this one VLAN or VLAN 1. So what we need to do is change that to trunk multiple VLANs. And then we're going to say allowed VLANs 2 to 4090. Now, you can by all means only allow the VLANs you wish to trunk. Um, I only do this because it means that I can allow every VLAN and never have to worry about adding the other VLAN in um, at a later date. Please don't tick the tagged option. Um, that will actually start tagging the native VLAN unless your switches are configured to tag the native VLAN. Um, it won't work. So I actually find it catches more people out. So let the switch do the hard work for you and work out what the untagged or the native VLAN should be. And then just tag the other VLANs that you require. But don't tick this option here. Also, depending on the access point you have, you may have multiple Ethernet ports. 
you can treat it like a switch and tag other VLANs on those other ports as well. But it's entirely up to you. So then we have security. So you can enable rogue AP detection, you can enable IP spoofing protection, smurf attacks, log messages, enable fragmented packet ping protection. It's really up to you how far you want to go your security and what you'd like to enable. So for the purpose of this video, I'm just going to leave it all at default and just enable rogue AP detection. You then come on to different services. So Apple devices have the ability to uh, use something called AirPlay, AirPrint, for example. Now, they have to be on the same subnet, which isn't always feasible. So what we can do is we can actually select AirPrint, for example, or AirPlay, or Apple TV, and select the VLAN where the Apple TV is residing from, and select the VLAN we'd like to broadcast it to. This is then going to re-advertise those services so that devices can connect to the Apple TV, but the Apple TV isn't causing too much traffic overhead on a subnet that's, that it, the other clients are from all the other services it can offer. And once you've done that, you just click Add. So now we've created our first AP group, just going to click Save. Going to wait for the spinny wheel to stop, and then we'll actually be able to go to our AP. So now I can click on Home. So I'm going to click on the Home icon in the far left-hand side, and then I'm going to go to Onboard Devices. So now, before I click Approve, I'm going to click the little pencil icon. So I can choose the AP group. I can choose to update the software. So you can see it's on version 3.8.r3, and the later version is 3.11, so I'm going to select that. I can select the location. So if I've created sites, I can actually choose the location and give it the longitude and latitude and pinpoint it to the location of where my devices are, which can be really handy to do. And then I can modify the basic details. So I'm going to rename it to be Podicom AP. And just before I click Save, I'm just going to go back to Configure Device. From here, we can change everything from the Rojo setting. So we can change the location, choose whether 2.4 band is going to be enabled or disabled and override certain settings. We can choose the VLAN or static IP address of the device. We can choose other VLANs if we've got them configured. And we can choose an override settings about a WLAN. So we can rename the SSID. We can disable the SSID. We can even change the passphrase specifically for that access point. So you've got a lot of power from a free platform. So I'm going to click Save. And then I'm going to click Approve. So when I click Approve, what's going to do now? It's going to download the firmware. It's going to update the configuration. So you'll notice the LED on the front of the unit, um, if you've got one in front of you, will now become blue. Now, this process can take five to 10 minutes, but you only have to do it once. And once it's done, you don't have to worry about it again, other than updating firmware, which again takes a couple of minutes, and that's it. So now your access point's onboarded, we can connect some devices. So I'm going to go away and connect my Apple devices I've got around me on my laptop, and then we'll be able to go to the AP tab and we'll be able to see everything about the device that are connected. So you can do this one of two ways. You can click on AP groups, and this will show you all the clients connected as well. And this will be across every single access point in your estate. Or you can go to access points directly. Now, because I've only got the one, I'm just going to click on access points directly. I'm going to select my access point, and then I'm going to click on clients. So from here, you can see everything about the devices. So you can actually click on one. So if I click on Alex Work, I can see what band it's on, the MAC address, the mode it's connected to. So it's connected to a GRN speeds. Um, my access point is actually downstairs, so it's a bit far from where I'm actually recording this video at the moment. The OS type, the RSSI, AP MAC address, connected AP, the data rate, the VLAN ID, your status, everything about it. Now, that's really great, but you can also then see what WLANs are connected to it. So you can see how much traffic we've uplinked and downlinked. We can see the BSS ID, the security. I can then go onto the dashboard of the actual access point itself. Now, all of these features are the same whether you're in AP group or an access point. You see the exact same thing. So you can see here that I've got four clients connected, my throughput, the channels that I'm on for 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. You can then see the product name, the IP address, the serial number, the radio details, so the power they're on, um, you can see the clients by performance, which one's sending the most amount of data at this given time, signal to noise ratio, clients by radio. 
it's really powerful. You can then go on to notifications. Now, there are no notifications at the moment, so it's not really going to show anything, but you can see alarms, events, history. You can see when it was updated, the clients are connected, so you can view details of that wireless client there and keep going through all the different events. You can then click on configuration, and this is where you can do some manual configuration, manual override, if you want to turn off a certain radio, change the location, even factory reset the unit if you really want to. Um, we then have details. So here we can see everything from a different window, effectively. So we can see it's a dual band AP, multi-user MIMO supported, the different MAC, ad MAC addresses for the different radios, the RF quality as well. So we can also look at our network information. So we can see what VLAN we're using, what Ethernet port, what our default routes are, what our DNS servers are. Um, and if we've got any GRE tunnels or PPPE tunnels, we can see all of that, as well as our neighbors list. Now, I'm not expecting to see anything here because we don't have any other Cambium APs powered on at the moment, but if you did, you'd be able to see them in the section here. Heading over to performance now. Again, you can see your throughput. So if I go to four hours, because it's only been on for a few moments, you can see you get different graphs, which you can export as well. We can change the graph layout, see what you want to see as well from here. So once that's caught up, you can then click on software update. So we've already updated the AP, but you can schedule a software update. Say, so I'd like it to be updated on the second of the month, and I want it to be done at, I don't know, 16.05 p.m and then click Add Software Job, and at that time, it'll actually go away and update the AP. Now, the nice other thing that we have at our disposal is tools. So, we can download the software, or download the tech support, sorry, for the access point. We can see the clients connected to the access point. We can even reboot the access point. If there was a subscriber module, we'd also be able to see that connected to it. We can then run debugging commands, whether it's advanced or basic. Now, this is only really used by Camium themselves, so hopefully you'll never have to use Camium support. And that's the same for packet cap. You don't really need to use it unless Cambium asks you to do so in a support case. Looking at network connectivity, we can do everything from ping, DNS, trace routes. If I just ping Google, so 8.8.8.8 .8 and click start ping, you see it's initiated. I'm hoping it's going to say it's successful, which it looks like it is. And then we can look at the Wi-Fi analyzer section. So I'm going to start with 2.4 gigahertz and click start scan. And we can see how interference heavy my network is or what's around me and see what interference sources there are. So you can see on 2.4 gigahertz, we've got a, another access point, one that I'm actually having to test at the network at the moment called Ruckus. You've then got two other devices, one's on channel one, one's on channel six. And the signal noise ratio is quite loud. So I can also see it by interference, by number of APs as well, and see which APs are stealing up most of the spectrum. I can then do the same for 5 gigahertz and do the exact same scan again and see how busy the 5 gigahertz spectrum is. Now, I'm in a residential area. The chances are most other devices around me or other home hub type routers or modems probably won't support 5 gig, and that's the case here. So the only one that is supporting 5 gig is the other access point I'm testing for another video that I need to do later on. So you can see our 5 gigahertz spectrum is very clean. Now, this gives you the ability to really troubleshoot and work out what your Wi-Fi environment is like from a single pane of glass. So I'm going to head back over to our dashboard now, click on our home page, and from here you've got quick guides so you can click straight to update software, configure your devices, add users so you can have more people join your network, create your own custom Wi-Fi portals, start generating reports and managing alarms, you can even go to our support center, so for documents, community, or if you want documents, community, or if you want to submit a feature request, click on ideas, or actually raise a support ticket, as well as quick handy guides such as troubleshooting Wi-Fi. So you can click on that, it's going to take you to a new page from a help guide, and it's going to tell you all about the different ways you can adjust and troubleshoot your Wi-Fi system. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you again soon.